Hey, welcome everybody today. I'm glad you're here at Littleton Church. If you're a first time guest, it is great to see you. We want to get to know you, so stick around with us. Uh, we are in this new season. It's the season of Lent. I don't know if you're aware of it. It started on Wednesday, and uh, no, uh, Joe Biden didn't have a bruise on his forehead. He went to a Lenten service. <laughs> Um, and so like many of us did, we went to a Lenten service uh, this week. Uh, I want to share a little bit about you. I mean, about me, a little bit about you. <laughs> a little bit about me. Uh, I one time wanted to run a 5K. It was a fun run. So let me just preface it with that. You'll know the difference between a fun run and a 5K. A fun run, they don't really keep up with the times. Unless you're like a real runner, then you keep up with your own time. You're like, first, or I beat my personal best. But I, I, I wanted to do this fun run, and it was something that a, a lot of us were going to do at the church that I was at in Alabama. And everybody was going to be a part of this fun run. as was raising a bunch of money from, for something that I can't remember. <laughs> but I thought it would be a great idea for all of us to do this fun run together to support this organization. And it kept coming, and I thought... This is going to be something great for me. I'm going to be able to get into some shape. I'm going to be able to run nonstop this 5K. Well, the time got closer and closer and closer. You might know where this is going. Um, I didn't start running. I didn't start training. I didn't start working out. I just... As it got closer, I thought, I'll just, I'll just wing a 5K. I'll just, I'll just run it without any preparation. I'd never done a 5K before. And I thought, I, I can do this. I'm a, I'm a young man. I think I was still in my 20s at the time. It's a long time ago. And so I did the typical mistake as we started the run. I, I started way too fast. Any runners out there? You know what I'm talking about? I didn't choose a, a good pace. I just, I just ran. And as you might imagine, I ran out of steam quite quickly. I mean, my, my, my sides were splitting. My, my lungs were burning. You know, all the things that I don't know why runners like to run, you know, but that you have to push through the pain. My, my legs were heavy. It was, it, was, it was pretty embarrassing. And then to top it all off, uh, one of our elder's wives, who was in her 70s, I heard her say, on your left. And, dude, she just hummed right on. And, you know, my pride wanted to, like, run fast and go past her, but I knew it wouldn't work. It was over. She was an experienced runner. I was not. I mean, you, you know what happened. I, I, I should have prepared. I should have prepared for this run. It would have been a, a more gratifying experience for me. I would have felt more joyful in this run if I would have, prepared for it. I would have gotten the, the best out of it with the people in community if I were to only have prepared for it. But I didn't. I didn't. And maybe you have been in a similar situation where there was a, a birthday coming up or a wedding coming up or a milestone coming up in your life or the life of somebody else. There was a vacation coming up or a holiday coming up, and, and as the calendar counted down, you didn't prepare for it, you just dreaded it, or you didn't prepare for it, you just let it happen. And, and, and you might recall what that experience was like, maybe scrambling last minute, or missing out on opportunities to make sure that people were present, or missing out on opportunities to make sure that people were having a good experience as well, because in the moment, you were so stressed, you were so overwhelmed, you, you chose not to prepare. And when we don't prepare for things, sometimes we're not able to actually be as present as we would like to be. When we're not prepared for things, we're not able to show up with our full selves and receive all that the situation, the event has for us, the run can bring us. And I think a lot of times that's what happens to us in our lives. We we go through life, maybe we call it coasting, or we go through life maybe letting life happen to us. But you have some agency as a, a human being, somebody who's been made in the image of God. You have the ability to be ready, 
right? You have the ability to, to get ready. And I believe that's what the season of Lent is. It's a season of preparation. It's a season of preparation that commemorates the death and the resurrection of Jesus at Easter. Some 40 days from now, that whenever we celebrate that Jesus gave his life on the cross, that he died and he rose again, and that he conquered sin and death for all of us who believe, that we can be prepared for when that comes, just as we thoughtfully prepared for individual moments in our lives, like our, our wedding and birthdays or for special occasions, that Lent can be an invitation for us to prepare our hearts and minds for glorifying Jesus' life, his death, and his bodily resurrection. Lent is meant to be that time of preparation. And, it, and what happens in Lent is that we choose to repent. We say we're going to get ready to receive all that God has for us in Jesus by by turning away from our sins and turning to him, by confessing that we need God, that we need Jesus, that, that our lives are, are not whole, that we need God to make them whole, that we're not experiencing life to the fullest, that God can only bring that to us, that we're not, we're not experiencing things the way God had originally designed us to because there may be sin in our lives or we may, we may be just letting life pass us by. But Lent is an opportunity for us to have a humble understanding of knowing that we are born and that we sin, and that we must turn away and turn to God. The purpose of Lent is to fully recognize our brokenness as humans and our need for a Savior. And Lent allows us to reflect and open our hearts to Jesus. And so I'm encouraging us in the sermon series that we enter into Lent and we say, we're going to be prepared. We're going to get ready. Can somebody say, get ready? We're going to get ready for when it comes. Maybe, maybe for you there's been a dullness that has entered into your heart and life over some of the most profound miracles of Christ. A dullness. It just seems dim. It seems like it might sneak up on you that Christ has arisen. But no, no. Not this year, somebody right? Come on now. Not this year, somebody. That there can be a renewal in your heart for Christ. I love seasons like this. Life happens in seasons. Like we always talk about it. Sometimes Christians like to use overuse season a lot. Oh, I'm just, just not in this season, you know. <laughs> but we want to be like people who are engaged in the life of Christ, whether in season or out of season. Come on, somebody. Like we want to be engaged in the life of Christ and be like, uh, we are ready for what Christ has for us in a new way. I'm going to allow Christ this season, all right, to transform me in a new way that I haven't discovered before. Like I'm going to allow my heart to be open and broken before Christ where he can use me in ways that I thought he never could, where he can help me to be brave, that he can help me to see his pathway for me and the design he has for my life. Like this is going to be the season and I'm going to do that. But it only happens, lean in, if we choose to get ready. Can we stand together? I want us to read God's word together. It's found in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And this is a passage that is a part of the revised common lecture. It's a lot of churches follow this. Liturgical churches follow this. And it's the passage for this Sunday. And the passage for this Sunday at the beginning of the first Lenten Sunday is Jesus being tested in the wilderness. I'm going to need you to help me read. Can you read aloud the words that are in yellow as I read aloud the words in white? This is the word of God for the people of God, and everybody starts together. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Well, of course he was. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. He said, All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is a reading from God's word for you. Somebody say, I trust in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So after being baptized, Jesus doesn't first go and preach. That prior to this, Jesus is baptized by John in the River Jordan, and he says, I must do this to fulfill all righteousness. He, John had been baptizing people into repentance, saying, turn away from your sins and turn to God, for a new kingdom is coming. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And so Jesus goes through that, and he doesn't first go and preach. He first goes and fasts. That through fasting and prayer, Jesus was being prepared for what was going to happen next. He was being prepared for ministry. That he was going to go through a period of testing. Jesus was being prepared for ministry by following the Spirit. That Jesus' preparation was being tempted by the devil while being sustained by the Father. That he chose to trust in God. Jesus entered into this 40 days of prayer and fasting in the wilderness, united Jesus with the story of God's people up to this point. That Israel had to suffer 40 years of wandering because they didn't obey God in entering into the promised land. That, that Moses didn't even get to enter therein because of Israel's sin. And so Jesus is reenacting, I think, what Moses should have originally done for the people. But he's also connecting to the people's sufferings that the people had to first go through a 40 years of wandering, desert wanderings before they entered in. Jesus not only is doing a recorrection, a recreation, but he's also connecting to the pain and suffering. This is what Jesus is doing for us, saying, look, I know what it is like to be without. I know what it is like to wait and to rely on the Lord. I know what it's like to trust. And he trusts the Father and the Holy Spirit strengthens him. The angels strengthen him. But God is with him. So Jesus is strengthened there in this desert. And he's able to stand up against the testing of the evil one. In Matthew's gospel, it seems like the testing comes after all the fasting. And in other gospels, it writes it more in a way that says it's happened all through. You could say that Jesus has gone into the desert so that he could be tempted and tested, as Matthew says. But I think another way to reframe that is Jesus goes in the desert to be led by the Holy Spirit so that the Father could commune with him and build him up and strengthen him. It was time he spent with the Father. I think the devil thought that Jesus was at his weakest point. But I find this to be true about Jesus, that Jesus was at his strongest point, right? Right? That Jesus may have been weakened in the flesh, but his heart and his mind and his spirit were directed and focused on God the Father, that he trusted like it was elevated in a time for him. He was a heightened sense of awareness that Jesus lived in, but I think he demonstrates for us in this moment that God is real. God will protect. God will strengthen. God will nourish nourish me. God will give me the path because it's going to be a hard road. It's going to be tough to get out there and preach to people who are going to be resistant. I mean, we think now that we live in a resistant culture, Jesus did likewise. I mean, yes, I'm sure that a lot of people may have been open to hear what he had to say, but it was hard for Jesus too. Jesus went out in places where people hadn't heard the gospel before. Jesus didn't just go preach to Israel. He preached in the Decapolis, 10 cities of Gentiles. He preached in places where people were just overwhelmingly resistant to his message. And we we find that to be true. Don't think that Jesus was widely popular because he was crucified everyone his message took him to the cross so he had to be prepared for what was coming next and i believe when we follow christ what we learn is that when we trust in the father and are strengthened by the spirit we can stand up against the devil's temptations in our lives as well and we can be prepared to do the work that god has called us to do the work that he's prepared in advance for each and every one of us according to ephesians 2 10 That whenever we spend time getting ready, 
then we can partner in the work of Jesus together. When we spend time getting ready, we, we have the ability to have a, a heightened sense of awareness and focus for our creator God and how much he loves us and how much he can do good through us. So Jesus resists the temptation. He resists the temptation of stones into bread to turn from the Father's will and the Spirit's leading by breaking the fast and eating. Now, did Jesus have a thus saith the Lord that he must go and fast for 40 days? I don't think he's following a, a command or example here or necessarily for his life. Like, like before I go into ministry, I must. There was no ministry tract like he wasn't entering into graduate school or divinity school, and the professor said, for the assignment, you have to do 40 days of fasting and prayer. That This wasn't what Jesus was following. He, he was led by the urgings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit in his life to go and do this for his father. He was led, and, and he didn't want to break what he had committed to God, right? He didn't want to break that. The devil's wanting him to break it. The devil's saying, nah, let's break that. Why don't you use your power to turn these stones into bread? He was tempted to break the fast by eating. Eating in of itself is not bad, right? It's not a sin to eat. And finally, in fact, we see Jesus eating so much that he's accused of being a, a glutton by his detractors, by the people who are opposed to him. But in this moment, Jesus says, I'm not. I'm going to rely on the, the bread that comes from God. I'm going to rely on the word that comes from God. Man shall not live off bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Father. That's what Jesus was choosing to do. So he said, I'm not going to be tempted in that way. And then he was tempted to begin his ministry with spectacle. Jump off the temple in front of all the people and allow the angels to come and rescue you. Let's... Let's be big about this. Let's get a lot of lights. Let's be impressive. Jesus, let's be impressive. I want you to start a podcast. I want you to get on social media. I want you to have a million likes, right? I could see, and today, if somebody was trying to be someone who starts a platform, they'd get up at the top of the temple and say, hey, if I get a million likes, I'll jump off this temple and the angels will save me, everybody. That's not Jesus' ministry. He wasn't like John Morant who said that's how he'll enter into the NBA dunk contest next season, okay? We all want to see it. If y'all don't know who John Morant is, he plays for the Memphis Grizzlies. He's an exceptional dunker. Um, YouTube him, John Morant. But not right now. Yes, I heard somebody say that. There'll be an intermission in the sermon. You can YouTube it. Um, but that's not how he begins his ministry. In fact, Jesus begins very unimpressingly. <laughs> I mean, his origin is unimpressive. Going out in the desert after he's been baptized, that doesn't... I mean, after he's baptized, he should be like, everybody, okay, we're, let's go, let's go. But he doesn't. It's more important to him for the Holy Father to do, and the Spirit to do transformative work in his life so that he could be prepared to give all that he had, all God had to the people because that's what Jesus did in his life. He just gave what God had given him. And so he does that. He doesn't put himself in harm's way so that God could keep him safe. He doesn't play around with God. This isn't something to be toyed with. He, he refuses. And then Jesus was tempted to worship the devil. Give up the Father's will and receive all that you see before me. If you give up the Father's will, you will know true power and authority, Jesus. That's what the devil tempts him with, as if what the devil was offering him wasn't already God's. As if the devil had true power. I mean, he's referred to as being the prince of this world, the, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's got a lot of uh, different ways he's described. He has some authority, but his authority is limited. The enemy's limited in his He's not like God. He is not like God. He is not all-knowing. He's not all-seeing, and he's not all-powerful. 
somebody. The devil is weak compared to God. Now, he does have, he does have some reign and authority here. But the greatest thing that the devil does, to borrow a sports term, is trickeration. Okay? I don't know why they say it that way. Is to manipulate us and trick us. You notice that he used the word of God to try and manipulate Jesus to bend the Father's will and to bend his knee to him. How do we get ready? I mean, we have to be prepared. How is Jesus prepared here? He, with each temptation, Jesus quotes the law. He quotes actually the words of Moses from the book of Deuteronomy. So Jesus being like this in this where he was like a, a, new, a new Moses to the people is using Moses' words. He's like, and as Matthew's writing this, he knows the connection. And the people are understanding the connection. Jesus is, is quoting the law and the words of Moses, I was meeting with small group leaders today, and I read to them from John's gospel about how Philip connected Nathaniel with Jesus. And, and when Philip went to Nathaniel to tell him about Jesus, he said, this is the one whom, whom Moses wrote about in the law. Like they, were, they, they wanted to follow somebody who, who reminded them or was carrying them into this new age of following God through all the centuries. They, they now see Jesus is like Moses and Jesus with this temptation and being somebody who grew up learning the Word of God, grew up quoting the Word of God, grew up living the Word of God, grew up interpreting the Word of God, grew up worshiping the Word of God. Like, like Jesus, Jesus was ready for this moment. You could say this is years of work for Jesus. Last week I told you that before Jesus got to the cross, he'd been carrying it for years. That when he tells the disciples, you must take up your cross and carry it, it's something that he had been doing before he took up the literal wood and took the literal nails. Jesus was doing this his life, his whole life, following God's will, doing what God had called him to do, being obedient to his parents, uh, being kind to people, uh, loving his neighbor and loving God. Jesus had been taking up his cross, and he's ready for this moment. The devil attempted to use the word of God to manipulate him, but the power of God's word, hear me out, is not in quoting it, but trusting in it. The power of God's word is using God's word accurately and putting his word into practice. That's the power of God's word, putting it into practice. The power of God's word is not just putting it over your door frames. It is a reminder. That is something that we must internalize. The power of God's word isn't just getting a, a nice art piece and putting it in your living room. That's not the power in God's word. The, the power in God's word is believing that it's connected uh, inextricably to God. And that whenever I, 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 I put it in my heart and it starts to grow, then, then my that my actions then are connected to it, and it changes who I am, like from the inside out. That's what the Word of God does. Jesus says you're wise if you put it into practice. If you just hear it and you don't put it into practice, then it's like building a rickety old house on a rickety foundation. As soon as the wind comes, it blows over. But your faith, though, when it's put into practice, is strong in, in God. So we, we get ready by putting God's Word into practice, the power is in the practice. Jesus, though, didn't just practice it. He fulfilled it. As the Word incarnate, the living Word, Jesus, you could say, perfected it. Perfected it. I thought of a joke and then I stopped. Sorry, church. I was practicing temperance. I'll share it with you <clears throat> afterwards if someone wants to come up and ask me. Sometimes it throws the whole sermon off when you... Maybe like what's happening right now. <laughs> so then when Jesus puts this into practice, like then, then he's able to go out and do this. Then, then the Word of God says this, that in Mark's Gospel especially, it says, Jesus preached repentance and belief. He said, repent and believe in the good news. So then Jesus is ready after he comes out of this time of testing. He starts preaching God's word. I want us to be prepared for when Jesus, when we celebrate him with repentance this Easter. That we want to prepare our hearts to receive Jesus' suffering on the cross. We want to prepare our hearts 
to receive his death, and we want to make ourselves ready for his resurrection. And maybe Easter has lost somewhat of an edge for you. It's just another thing. And if you blink, you'll miss it. These 40 days will be over, and it'll be here, and it'll be gone. But it could be that you're not prepared yet to be in wonder of it and amazed once again by the glory of God. This is the miracle, church, that Jesus is alive. He's not in the grave. He's alive. You would be nothing without this. We would be nothing without this. Jesus is alive today. I used to not understand Christian gatherings, okay? I grew up Catholic. Uh, I was kind of unbothered by it, let me just say. Like I didn't ask enough questions as to why we did what we did. I mean, I kind of probably, I feel like I blinked and I went through catechism and I got confirmed and I did all the things. And Because sometimes y'all come to me and y'all think I'm the expert on Catholicism. Y'all done it to me many times. Javon, tell us about the Catholic Church. What y'all do in the Catholic Church? I, said, I don't know. I didn't even have a cell phone back then. You know what I mean? Like, I could understand if I had a cell phone all through catechism, through service. I'm like, you know, doing the thing and, you know, whatever. Like, I, I don't know. I really honestly don't know. Like, I can't remember. I remember some people's names. I remember some of the things we did that I, that, that I didn't really like, like confessing to Monsignor O'Connor. I used to make up sins. He was so intimidating. <laughs> so intimidating. Like, I didn't understand Christian gatherings, and I especially didn't even understand them when I started going to a Protestant church, and that didn't happen until I went to college. And I remember going into a small church, and everybody thought it was really formal with their traditions in the Church of Christ, but I was like, what are these people doing? Are they making it up as they go along? <laughs> was that communion? I mean, what is going on here? I mean, the preacher, the priest is not even wearing any robes. What is going on? Like, I didn't understand. I think I just didn't care to understand it. I wasn't understanding the preacher when I was in that small church in, in college. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Like, he'd be, like, preaching and reading God's Word, and, and people were, like, turning their Bibles and, like, following him. It was, like, that kind of church, you know? Uh, people were, like, just, and I was, like, what is happening? I went out and bought a Bible, and then I, I started reading it. I was, like, I don't know where to go. Like, people were, like, did you have a Bible when you were in the Catholic church? I said, yes. I, I remember I put tabs in it. That's about the most I did with that thing. I put tabs in it. But I started reading God's Word, and I started, God's Word was calling me to a life of prayer, and I started praying, and God's Word was taught, calling me to a life of service, and I started serving. And, and you know what? I started to understand what was happening more in Sunday worship. Like, I, in the middle of the week, I'd be, like, reading and praying and be a part of, of Bible studies. And then it, when I got to service, I'd be like, oh, that making a connection. Oh, that makes sense now. I, I didn't know what the preacher was preaching until I started reading. And then I started to get all the references. It wasn't until I started to get prepared to meet with God's people. Only then, only then was I able to bring my worship to the house of God. Only then was I able to do it when I started to be prepared. It, it seemed to matter much more to me, and I began to hold an eager expectation for Sundays. I, and that's never gone away from me, church. That's never gone away from me. At, at Pepperdine, I'm going to be uh, pre leading a class. It's uh, Harvard. It's like this big lectureship. And, and I'm going to talk about loving Sundays, like, like how, to make the, how to make Sunday your best Sunday. Because I was with some preachers uh, one time recently, and, and one of them was like, man, I dread Sundays. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're in a profession where you dread Sundays? And I'm like, how is that possible? Like, you got to work that out, brother. You got to work that out. You know what I mean? But I know how it is because some of us dread Mondays. We dread going to our job. It's like the worst, and we just want to do it. We want to get the paycheck. We're close to retirement. You know, we're all the things, right? <laughs> Got amen back there, right? And I, and I feel you. Like, I feel you, right? It's tough being in that position, but I just never wanted to be in that place. And what I learned is, like, I got to do some work during the week so that I can have something to give you as a preacher on Sundays. And I look forward to it. I always think that God's going to do something incredible like I don't I know, I, I know maybe you've done maybe you've been there too but then maybe you've had a series of disappointments in your life and you stopped you stopped having an amazement and wonder in God I'm not saying I'm I'm some amazing person because I have that I don't know I just feel like God's blessed me with the ability to be like God you're going to do something amazing somebody somebody is going to receive something from you when the people gather that's going to be potentially life-changing for them Amen. like I still believe that uh, call me crazy 
Call me naive. Call me idealistic. I still believe in the power of God that he could do something incredible in somebody's life in a moment in a flash or over a period of time. Something you never thought you'd be able to do or believe or see or whatever. Like God has that ability because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Come on now, somebody. He rose from the dead. I still believe that. I believe that. And that's the experience that I want for everyone. Like this eagerness and this expectation of the goodness of God, of the love of God and the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Like, I believe that. It's not just for Sundays. My imagination of what God could do expanded and spilled over into all of my life as Jesus grew in my heart. The desire to serve and minister filled my thoughts and my dreams. It was inescapable for me. And um, I always revisit that. I think that's why Paul tells us to revisit our baptisms. Remember your baptism. Remember you died to sin and you're alive in Jesus. Remember your baptism. Remember you put away the old ways, the filth of the flesh. And now you're alive in Christ. Remember your baptism. He he calls us to look back. And I I would love for you this year that, that this time of preparation is a season where you can look back and recall, just like you could do with your baptism, just like you could do with your confession when you believed in Christ for the first time, just like you can look back to when somebody invited you to church for the first time, just like you could look back at whenever you got married or look back whenever your first child was born. And those things would capture the wonder and the awe of those moments. And so you could be ready to receive the fullness of God for your life. That's our our vision here, to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. We're going to be ready to receive all the life and power that God has for us. It only happens because of Jesus. You give him a mustard-sized faith, and he grows the kingdom of God in your heart. Pray, fast, give. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Um, I want us to stand together. Um, I want us to be able to give our prayers to God in this moment. Um, If you're watching online, God bless you. We love you. And we want you to give God your prayers and praises. We want you to say, God, I I, want to get ready. Make me ready, God. Make me ready. Prepare me. Prepare me for what you have next for me. Prepare me to turn away from my sins and turn to you. Prepare me to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. That's, that's, what, that's what we're going to be in Lent. We're going to be in Lent. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be celebrating it together. I love all of you. I love all of you. And uh, I love uh, that we're reading God's Word together. Uh, I love that we're entering into the season relying on His Word and the goodness of God. May your, may your faith grow today. Oh, let me pray over you, and then let's worship. Holy Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for what He has offered us on the cross. May we be ready to receive the fullness of your love and the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit. May we prepare our lives for the glory that's found in Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus that we pray. Amen.